This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to another episode of the Human Action Podcast. This is a bit of a bonus episode because, as you know, we usually focus on books and discuss various uh, books in the Austrian or libertarian areas. But this week, we're actually going to talk about a paper. So uh, something I rarely do, which is discuss and bring on a guest to, to talk about an academic journal paper, because I think I find a lot of academic writing pretty dense and not particularly useful for our audience. But this one was too good to pass up. Our guest is Dr. Philip Bogus. A lot of you know him. As a fellow here at the Mises Institute, he teaches in Madrid at Ray Juan Carlos University. He has an accolade of sorts of uh, Huerta de Sota. And uh, more importantly, you probably know him as a monetary policy guy because he's written extensively about inflation. He wrote the wonderful book, Tragedy of the Euro, which is a fantastic, short, succinct summary and background of the creation of that awful uh, currency. He wrote an amazing book about Iceland's crisis and how they dealt with that by the, the right way, by giving haircuts to the creditors of the banks and, and firing management. So he's written a lot about money and deflation. But more recently, he's written a paper titled COVID-19 and the Political Economy of Mass Hysteria. So you heard that right, the political economy. And Philip, before we get into this, I want to mention that you have two Spanish co-authors, uh, Jose Antonio Peña Ramos and Antonio Sanchez Bayon, a couple of long names there. Uh, so it's not entirely Philip's work, but it is, you know, uh, when I saw this and I was able to read it, I was so excited because uh, obviously most of our listeners know that the Mises Institute, we've been strong critics of what we would consider a huge overreaction by governments across the world uh, to the COVID-19 virus and also by their media accomplices. So this paper uh, views all that through the lens of political economy. So with that lengthy introduction behind us, Philip, good afternoon. It is great to talk to you after a long time. Thank you very much, Jeff. Good afternoon to you. Well, I guess first and foremost, what prompted you to write this article? Well, obviously, this is one of the biggest crises uh, that, that we have experienced. And I think the biggest crisis after the Second World War. And the measures that politicians are doing are just outrageous and very hard to, to explain um, because they are not what was done in the past. It's a total overreaction to the threat of the virus. And I thought I would try to give my contribution that um, th this uh, craziness may, may end and analyze it. And then I tried to, yeah, from different perspectives because it's an interdisciplinary approach. So we use uh, psychology and political economy, mostly mass psychology and uh, health issues uh, put together in order to explain what, uh, what a mass hysteria is. And then, of course, from a political economy perspective, when is it more likely to occur and where can it create more destruction or problems in a free society or we, we put minimum, minimum state or free society or with the modern welfare state? You know, make this comparison. Well, I have to say the article is very readable. Now, it's heavily footnoted, but I'm going to link to this in our show notes. And thankfully, it's available publicly. You don't have to be a subscriber to a journal. It's the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Uh, so I'll link to it. And I encourage people to read it because it's only about 10 pages long. And I would argue that it's written in a very lay-friendly style, despite all the footnotes. But, Philip, you bring up psychology and the interdisciplinary nature of this. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. You know, normally when we talk about mass hysteria, you think, well, that's a subject matter for journalists or media experts or psychologists. So the criticism is going to be, what, who's this economist to talk about <laughs> mass hysteria? Yeah, I guess if you ask like this, you could also ask, of course, why, why would a psychologist write about the political economy of mass hysteria? Yeah, And then no one can do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually... Uh, what is missed in academia is, uh, well, one problem of it is the over-specialization. And then if you just focus on, then on your over-specialized subject, then never ever uh, such a synthesis, such an interdisciplinary work could, could be done. So someone had to do it, and uh, yeah, I did it. 
And was the journal receptive? Was it easy to get it published? Well, some of the referees had issues and academic editor, um, you, you said that it's very well readable. Yeah, one of the critiques was actually that is it reads very journalistic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, so, but I translated it as meaning that it's very well readable. Um, the paper, so it was actually a compliment. But it, <laughs> and they wanted mm -hmm. to have, of course, they wanted more um, numbers as always, more data. So we added also a, a table on what uh, surveillability uh, rates and and the mortality of the of other illnesses. But then I said to them, "Hey, look! From the very beginning, we wanted to make a, a qualitative um, <clears throat> analysis of the political economy grounded in economic principles." We said this from the very beginning. You want this or not? And then they were. They said yes. They wanted it. Well, I think the data helps because when you look at the overall fatality behind COVID and then when you also compare it to other uh, similar incidents in human history, I think that helps us decide whether or not this is, in fact, a hysterical approach that most of the world governments have taken. Yeah, yeah, surely. Yeah, that, that was actually a good recommendation from the reviewers. Um, I guess they would have liked to have... Uh, econometrical analysis also, but we didn't, we didn't do that. Well, so the term political economy is pretty broad. It means different things. How do you generally define it and, and how do you apply it here to the COVID crisis? Yeah, it's an uh, economic analysis of policies and we apply it to the, uh, to the COVID crisis. Um, but actually in the, in the paper, COVID is more like the reason and the case to illustrate our general point, which is that mass hysteria become much more likely uh, to develop and to grow in a modern welfare state, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, a minimum state or free society. And when we take COVID as, a, as, an, as an example, um, of course, we cannot, it's hard to say if COVID-19 direction is really a mass hysteria, because how would you measure that? Again, of course, say, well, uh, uh, the mortality rates are these, and, and then you say, oh, this is uh, overreaction. But of course, it, there does not exist any measurable numbers where you could say, okay, yes, this is a mass hysteria or not. I personally think it is, <laughs> because, because many people are totally overreacting, are not meeting with other people, uh, are not leaving their houses, um, they drive alone in cars with masks, and of course, the political reactions are totally overblown. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've heard a lot of use of the magic phrase public health over the past year. And as you point out, if we're going to conceptually accept the notion of public health, then this sort of necessarily implicates the welfare state, because if it's public, that implies that the government is in charge of it and ought to be saving us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> public health does not exist. There exists only individual health. And uh, the policy measures in the, like the lockdowns, they may be good for the individual health of some people, but they are bad for the individual health of other people, <laughs> of the people uh, who get psychological problems, who get depressions, who commit suicide, who, who fall to alcoholism, <clears throat> and so on. For those people, of, and for the general population, as the living standards fall, and the living standards fall, um, life expectancy also, also falls. So there does not exist one public health where we would use, where you could say something is good for this public health because there's only individual health. So the whole concept, yeah, is totally, totally wrong. But what you mentioned is, and when the state, in a welfare state, is in charge of it, and then it gives itself a special authority that people believe the state should care for public health and they believe what the state says and when the state overreacts and uh, portrays it as a, as a horrible threat people tend to believe it and then then they get stressed and they get into anxiety and this is the perfect environment for a mass hysteria to develop because when there's stress and anxiety people uh, can fall or succumb to a mass hysteria much easier one thing you mentioned throughout the paper, which strikes me as very different from big catastrophic events in the past, like 9-11 or something like that, is the prevalence of social media. It seems like social media uh, plays a huge role in, in what we're experiencing. Yes, exactly. Um, in fact, past mass hysteria 
and there's a huge literature that I discovered and read about it. Past mass hysteria are more in a localized, restricted setting, such in schools. There's uh, cases of a laughing hysteria. People, for some reason, start to laugh and other people continue to laugh all day. Or in companies, there's mass hysteria. Someone saw, saw a bug and then he, he starts to have some symptoms and scratch and then other people do also. And then finally it comes out that the bug never existed. But with the social media, the contagion of this anxiety and stress is much faster and much global. So I think that we get to the point that there can be a global mass hysteria, something that was not possible before. We did not have before because we did not have the social media and this constant messaging, because this is very important. We have the human mind has a negativity bias for evolutionary reasons. We concentrate on bad news because when our ancestors would not have concentrated on bad news, they would have died. Mm -hmm. So we look for bad news. <clears throat> but if we get this bad news constantly, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week, and we see case numbers going up and death going up, and this, when we, with social media, we are, we are connected all day to this bad news, this creates an amount of stress and anxiety that is unbearable and has important psychological uh, problems, and it's a, it's a very fertile ground for a mass hysteria to develop. So one thing you, you point out throughout is that there's now this nexus between not only state institutions, which unfortunately have been viewed as the authoritative source of information and data about COVID, but the way that they work with media, with science, with politics, with the public. And it's this nexus of all these things coming together, which just feels different this time around because it's so it's, it's international in scope. And so COVID-19 is sort of the first truly global pandemic in the, in the public's consciousness. Yeah, exactly. It's the first one. And as you said, the media, if it's politized, politicized, plays an important role in uh, spreading the contagion of fear and stress and, and the mass hysteria. Because when the media, that is also now we are connected with the media through the social media, <clears throat> media outlets, they go on the side of the state and spread panic news. Of course, this panic news also sell. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. in the sense, it's totally uh, rational for them to do so. But when we have this politicized media, where we have public TV channels, where you need uh, licenses, on, and well, of course the media, they get the information from the politics. So there's always this uh, close collection between the media because the media gets insider information from the politicians and, uh, and therefore they tell what the politicians want, want to tell. And of course, all we have this problem of state education, that we have public universities and public curricula, state curricula. So journalists went through this education mm -hmm. and tend to be very uh, uh, statists. Um, not all, but there's a tendency. You know? And then when we have this connection between the state, a strong state and the media, and they both foster the panic, it's a perfect storm for a mass hysteria to develop. Now, you talk about this concept of what kind of mechanisms in society either amplify or attenuate this hysterical thinking. And, and you say that welfare states, or let's just say bigger governments, uh, have certain mechanisms by which they amplify hysteria. And you lay out five or six points. Can you just briefly touch on how a bigger government tends to amplify things and, and how this happens mechanically? Yeah, sure. One is what, what I just talked about, that, the, that there's a politicized mass media that then contributes and spreads the hysteria. This would not exist in a free society, a political, politicized mass media. Then what I also mentioned was that when we get negative information from an authoritative source, it has a much stronger impact for us. We have now people like um, Fauci in the U.S., in other countries, we have other experts, but they are looked upon uh, with much admiration because they have gotten the approval, the sacred approval almost of the state. Mm -hmm. no? And they have such a high authority and they are responsible for public health. So they, we believe and when the government and these experts fall prey to a mass hysteria and then as an authoritative source bring us this negative uh, information, 
that it's a horrible threat and deadly threat and millions will die, then people believe it uh, or tend to believe it. Some, something that would not happen in a free society because there would be no such institution responsible for public health and there would be different, many, many different experts that, that would be experts Why would they be experts? Because they would have been good, good doctors maybe in the past. And, but these experts today, they are in the position where they are because they have a good connection to the state. Yeah. They arose to this position not because they are good doctors or so, but, but because they are connected to the interests of the state. And what I not have mentioned uh, yet is that the state by its very nature deals with problems and threats in a centralized way, which means that there's no alternatives allowed. Experimentation is not allowed. So if in a free society we would have a virus and we don't know how deadly it is, some people might say, well, I'm a business owner and I close my business. Others would try other approaches and say, okay, people who get into my, my store, they have to wear masks. Other may do a temperature, they take temperature. And some, some store owners may say, well, everyone can come in as, as before. So there are different approaches that allow for experimentation also to observe the results. And when people who have not fallen, have not succumbed to the mass hysteria, and they can observe, okay, these people, these people have opened their stores and people came in and they don't die immediately, they are still alive. So um, the stress and anxiety of, the, of those people is reduced and the group of the people who have succumbed to the hysteria shrinks yeah, and gets smaller and smaller because you can observe the different results. While when you have a centralized approach which comes together with group thinking, yeah, then no alternative approaches are allowed whatsoever. There's just a lockdown for the whole country. Yeah. It's, it's good that we don't have a world state, a world government. If you would have a world, world government, then we would have a lockdown of the whole world, probably. Yeah, At least we can look to other countries like to Sweden or to Japan to see that other approaches also, also work. Yeah. So the more decentralized the system is, the more, uh, the more experimentation can go on and the more information is also created that is needed to deal uh, with the threat and to know. Uh, how how big the threat actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, so the possibility of experimentation with alternate alternative solutions is one uh, point. Um, and then fear. Fear is used as a political factor yeah, by the state. The state rests actually on fear. It instills fear mm, on the population and it's always present itself to save people from some threat, be it a foreign attacker, Uh, for an attack, there could be a threat, uh, someone who has weapons of mass destruction or, or whatever, or also the threat of poverty or the threat of uh, yeah, health problems. <clears throat> so the, the state itself, its story, it's, I, I protect you against all the threats. Yeah. And uh, it can increase its power by inventing threats. Yeah, and, and it has done so in the past. Yeah, it did so with the, the weapons of mass destructions. It's uh, using the threat of uh, terrorism to increase in state power. <clears throat> so the state deliberately plays with fear. And if you have this in such a situation where there is a threat and the possibility of a mass hysteria, and then comes the threat and the state and spreads panic, yeah, then uh, mass hysteria becomes, becomes more and more likely. And there are cases, there, there are very clear cases. For example, in Germany, uh, last March, there, were like, there was an internal paper uh, from the Ministry of the Interior that was leaked to the public. And the experts actually, they did recommend the government to instill fear in the population. How? First, They um, said uh, the government should appeal to, to, the, to the fear of, of dying without oxygen, yeah? which is a primordial fear that people have. Um, the, the other thing was to, uh, to instill fear in, in children, that if children would get it and play with their friends and then their parents would die a horrible death at home or their grandparents. Yeah? So, so actually very evil evil techniques and the third one was to 
to say, oh, there may be very harmful long-term consequences of COVID, even if you recover, it may be that in the future, these people suddenly die. So all this fear was deliberately, and we know it, we know it because the paper was, was linked, is deliberately instilled in the population. Yeah. And the last factor that I, um, that I mentioned and that Hans Hoppe also has talked about is that uh, politicians can pass on yeah, the costs of wrong decisions to third parties. Yeah, so if there's a lockdown, um, the costs are not borne by politicians. Uh, in fact, they still get their salary and they, their power is actually increased. So the psychic inc income is increased, but the costs are bear borne by others, by third parties, by everyone who's, who's locked up, locked down, People who lose their uh, businesses, people, people whose families are just destroyed, people who get depressions, or the costs are not borne by politicians. And they face an asymmetric payoff because if they underestimate the threat, let's imagine that they would underestimate the threat, and then people die. And when people die, that's just a problem for politicians. If, if they can be made responsible, they will, yeah, tear it and feed it up. If, if something like this happens. But if they overestimate the threat, this problem does not occur for them because if they are right, they are like the heroes because they, they protected the population. And if they are wrong, if they're overdoing it, well, the costs are only seen later. Maybe later on people die because their cancer has been, due to the lockdown, the cancer has been detected later or people will get a depression and... Uh, or uh, alcoholism, they die maybe years later. But this cannot be clearly connected to the, to the lockdown. And it's also much longer when these, people, when these politicians are probably already out of power. So they have the in incentive to exaggerate the threat. And, uh, and, and in any case, even though if they overdo it, they can always, always rely on their experts and on the media to say it was necessary. Look, uh, if we would not have done it, Millions of people would have died of COVID. So, so they can always do it. So the, the clear incentive of them is to over exaggerate the threat and then yeah, do these measures like lockdowns. And if people, if people are locked down and the government locks them down, they may think, think well, this must be a really, really a great threat, threat if they do such harsh measures. So this then contributes to the, to the hysteria. Well, maybe that's the most important single takeaway from this paper is that the incentives are all wrong. In other words, not only politicians, but media figures, academic scientists, etc. There, there's a, a benefit, perhaps, to them to creating hysteria. And the detriment is spread out over all of us, the citizens, and oftentimes over time as well. So that's, that's what's so frustrating oftentimes about state action. We saw this after 9-11 as well. Well, you know, if we don't act there, we're all going to be killed by terrorists. And now you can fast forward 20 years and say, well, because we put all these new measures in place at the airport and ruined your flying experience, there haven't been any big terrorist attacks. So that's what made you safe. <laughs> and of course, we can't know that. And this, this strikes me as certainly the biggest event since 9-11. You mentioned that it's maybe the biggest event since World War II, and I guess I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's it's staggering to think about it. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to say that uh, I think this paper is fantastic. Again, we're going to link to it. Everybody, take the time to read it this weekend. You can read it very quickly. Um, it's the kind of important work that's that's going on out there that needs to be going on. People like Philip Bogus need to be uh, better known, uh, uh, you know, by media figures and by others, because we have to be pushing back on the narrative. We have to be the counter hysterics of a sort. So all that said, I want to thank Philip Bogus, Dr. Philip Bogus, Professor Philip Bogus for his time. We are going to link not only to this article, but to my synopsis of it, to some of his other books. And I'm just going to recommend all of you to follow him on Twitter at Philip Bogus. That is 1L2Ps, at Philip Bogus, B-A-G-U-S. And to check out some of his work in our store, because uh, I got to tell you, if you're interested in the sordid background on the euro <laughs> and how, why the Germans gave up the Deutschmark, is, uh, uh, the tragedy of the euro is the book for you. And if you're interested in what Iceland did after the financial crisis and why their crisis was rather short, well, 
Dr. Boggs' book on that has the answers. In, in part, they let their creditors take a haircut. They fired all their management, installed new boards. And guess what? They let their currency float so that employers could actually pay wages. So uh, Dr. Boggess has really a plethora of, of fantastic and accessible lay-friendly writing that I think you need to check out. So, Philip, uh, thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful weekend in Madrid. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for your kind words, and I really enjoyed uh, the interview. Have a good weekend, too. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.